Um, it's uh, always uh, daunting to be the last talk of the evening, so I'm sure uh, everybody wants to get this over with so that we can go and have uh, dinner. Um, I'll, I'll, this is a nicely follow from uh, my previous uh, colleagues' uh, talks as uh, we're going down the leg. Um, and don't worry, there's not going to be lots of slides and back procedures, but there'll be like a, a, just a thoughtful process of uh, why we've got these sort of two pictures. And I've got two comments to make. that. Um, as uh, Dr. Ramun and Bashar have said about the data for the um, vascular conditions is very important. Well, unfortunately, data for below knee disease is very poor compared to iliofemoral um, conditions and aortic conditions. So that's the first comment. And the second comment will come to this, the reason of this, uh, the title of the talk is expectation and reality. And that will explain why I've got a picture of a man who's fishing and then a guy who's uh, smoking uh, uh, Dr. Ramun's uh, shisha. And um, the reason is this is the expectation, okay? So this is the expectation. You go, this is from uh, some just clippings from uh, industry websites about new devices, new techniques. As previously mentioned, they tell you that um, these patients are, as you can see, they're very happy, they're smiling, they're very active. Uh, someone's fishing, someone's sailing, someone's cycling. And that's the expectation, that these patients are already healthy and you're going to make them better so that you can have excellent results so they can carry on with their activities. So that is the expectation. The reality, I suspect, is something like this. With all due respect to this gentleman, but this, these are our patients. They're not very healthy to start off with. They don't want to sail. They don't want to do that. And I always was surprised, the surprise since coming back from London is that I've seen patients that you have, have uh, done complex PCIs and maybe two or three times, and they're still smoking. So if you guys haven't managed to scare them into stopping smoking, I have no chance. So unfortunately, that's, that's, our, that's the reality from patients-wise, and we'll talk about the results as well. And the reason is, there's a disconnect between what we're told from data and what we get in terms of patients and results. So that's the second sort of comment, because these are our patients. They're not happy and they're not active. They come in, they're really quite unwell. They come with extensive tissue loss and they come in late. And we have to deal with that, with ongoing infection and advancing gangrene and quite significant uh, peripheral arterial disease and possibly uh, not very compliant. So Dr. Mamoun is nicely sort of explaining to us about the peripheral arterial disease. Just a couple of comments is that I always keep wanting to remind myself that CLI actually is very common. It's not as uncommon as we think it is. An important point here is that we know that certain patients will progress to CLI quicker than others. And why is that? I mean, we've been, we've been told from large uh, scale studies is that diabetes is, is clearly a problem here. But also, we can see that renal failure and heart failure patients are really uh, also up there with, with diabetes. Now, we've got a group of patients which are primary CLI patients. Those patients don't progress from uh, asymptomatic claudicans and then go on to uh, having their toes uh, being black. They actually come straight away with, with CLI. Who, who are these patients? Yes, diabetes is up there, but not far off is heart failure and renal failure. And also, having stroke, MI, and hypertension can actually raise the risk by the hazard ratio of up to 10, 10 times, actually. So this really underlies the fact that the best thing that we could do to, for these group of patients is primary prevention or secondary prevention, depending on where you catch them, and risk factor modification, because the evidence says that this is probably much more important than any slide I'll have after this slide. So let's get to it. But distal revascularization. We've got to talk about um, uh, pedal bypass or fem distal bypass. Overwhelmingly, the most Robust data supports this practice, okay? So it has the longest, it's very durable, and it has the longest rates and the highest rates of limb salvage, and we can't deny that. It's not just from sort of uh, single center or multi-center experience trials, it's from multi, it's from randomized trials, and one of the most respected is the Basel trial. That was published about, 10, about eight years ago. We've got the Basel II, which is going to be published probably next year, and that still tells us something, that actually surgery is good. It's the most durable, but there's a catch. It's very long-winded, but actually the way I understand it is that if my patient or your patient is going to survive longer than expected, you probably should be thinking about surgery rather than intervention. What is longer than expected means, as Dr. McMoon said, most of these patients will be dead within a couple of years. So if, if for any reason our patient it may survive more than two years, we actually have to try and to think why we're we not doing bypass. Because we see there is that the moment you move on from two years, patients who've had a first intervention approach for below knee do much worse. 
And we've all seen the patients that we've done an intervention on, they've done well for a year, then they've had another complex intervention, then another one, and they just go downhill very quickly. So the take home message from that, if my patient's going to survive longer, I'll think about surgery. Having said that, so this is just a, just a quick picture. This is a, one of my patients, a femme, uh, distal to posterior tibial, uh, bypass right of the ankle to reverse, saphenous vein, same thing here. They're not great pictures, they're not coming out very well, but this is an operating theatre angio, not, not like the ones we have in, in the cat lab. And this is what a great saphenous vein looks like outside the skin. Obviously, that would be tunneled. And as you see, it's a very long vein. And this is another case where I've gone right down to the ankle. So this is a, a very low uh, bypass. So, I agree with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Mamoun is that actually I enjoy doing bypasses, but femdistal bypasses can be very difficult, they can be very long and they are break, back breaking. So this procedure can take anything from four hours to six hours depending on the kind of assistance you have. And for me that's tiring and, and, and I still sort of think that a lot of other surgeons think that that's quite difficult. Okay, the other most important factor, sorry, is that actually you need, so the data supports using femdistal bypasses if you use a single great saphenous vein, that will give you the best results. If you start using a spliced vein or two veins joined up or a prosthetic vein, then for me, that's a waste of time. And I think that's why we do more interventions than I think we should, because the surgery is quite long and hard, and also I can't find many veins in Jordan that haven't been sort of taken by the cardiac surgeons. So therefore, if we don't have a good quality vein in the leg that we're going to be treating, because we know that below knee disease is symmetrical, then we have to do intervention. And that's why I think we do, um, for every sort of, I think, 10 interventions, uh, we do two, two or three bypasses at most. So this is the expectation. Again, we go back to the expectation. We're being sort of not going to rattle. It's too late to rattle all the results of these trials, but this, this is one of the first trials that uh, tried to tell us that the biggest problem was balloon angioplasty below the knee used to have a bad reputation because of restenosis. So we were convinced that actually putting a bit of drug on the balloon will make things much better. Three times as much restenosis, low extremity amputations if you don't use a drug balloon. That was the early message. So we have lots of adverse events with plain balloons versus drug balloons. So the story sort of fits. Then we had a reasonable trial, the debate below knee trial, which re-emphasized that point. So at that point, I think it was about 2013, we all got very excited about using drug balloons below the knee because, as Ms. Shah said, they did fantastically in the SFA or the fempop lesions. But actually, that wasn't true. We had a first bit of reality check here. In a sense, one of the most robust and strongest trials and biggest trials came out with this recommendation that actually below knee, Drug balloons don't work. Higher mortality, higher adverse limb events. So that actually was an independently adjudicated trial as opposed to the other trials. So that made us sort of take a step back and think maybe putting a drug on the end of the balloon is not the best thing for below knee. And we stopped doing this for a couple of years. Having said that, even, even this until this time, I don't think the, the answer is still um, a drug balloon because this is 2018 data and still there's no difference. It's as good as a plain balloon. So that's what the data tells us, okay? Uh, I know there's a lot of industry pressure to use it and you can use two, three, four balloons in a single case, but the data doesn't support it. Moving on to drug eluting stents, okay? There's, as we had the drug eluting the Zilva PTX and the Fempop region, now there are a lot of stents that are being manufactured for below the knee. And the advice was use it because you have less TLR, less, less lumen loss. Yes, a couple of trials have shown this, but actually, overwhelmingly, that wasn't supported by evidence. Moving on to atherectomy below the knee, or at least popliteal. Um, as the Dr. Mamoun said, there is really, it's a fashion, and we're, we're being pushed to sort of use these new devices with no real evidence. They're good, they can be helpful. So the reason why we started using atherectomy devices below the knee because below knee vessels are small. Okay, they're smaller than the fempop region. So the answer was stents weren't doing well and balloons aren't doing well because the vessels are small and they're calcifying and the drug isn't getting through to the calcium. Then we had this, atherectomy devices, whether it's rotational, uh, directional, etc. But actually, the only reason why this tells you is that it tells you that the patency is only better than the balloon alone. It adds procedure time, it adds radiation, it adds contrast. 
And look at the results, they're fantastic. They've got, these guys have got no amputation in one year, so clearly it must be fantastic. So this is the expectation, this is what we're being told. Use an atherectomy or use a drug balloon, you'll have no amputation in one year. Then they forget to tell you about the perforations and the bailouts, which are very low, I think. All of the systematic meta-analysis data do not support the use of either drug balloons or stents below the knee. This is the state now. We've got a couple of reasonably powered trials coming up uh, next year, but until then, that's fine. I'll put the, the uh, meta-analysis because it's deceiving and it, you know, it's titled an update on meta-analysis and systemic reviews. The reason is it comes out with a recommendation of using drug balloons or maybe stents in the below knee segment is because they've only, count, is they've only counted the lesions that are focal, so they're about, so they're less, they're about three, um, sorry, they're about three, uh, three to ten millimeter length, and focal disease with no calcification. I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually seen a lesion like that in our patient, non-calcified focal lesion. Uh, so that's, that's really where you've got to be careful. Look at the actual trial data. So we're going back to reality now. One in ten patients, so this is, this is a large database of US patients, one in 10 patients, irrespective of why they were doing it. They were doing it for claudicans, and a lot of them were actually were doing it for claudication in the US, and maybe my US colleagues can sort of verify that, but a lot of claudicans are being done in the US, and this is what we're expecting. One in 10 patients will have a major reintervention within a year, and that's the reality. So, we're just going to quickly rattle on the, about sort of the, a few just sort of tips, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you looking at the audience, I'm sure, you, you know, we're not going to be adding much to your knowledge, but we'll just go th straight through them, just as a sort of a, an exercise. Below knee disease doesn't mean below knee intervention. Uh, as Bashar showed in this picture, our patients usually come with iliac disease, with SFA disease, which you have to fix before you get to, to the... Um, to the below knee segment. This is a sort of a very sort of, this is completely occluded iliac that you have to treat and then go below. Uh, the following case is a very long SFA lesion where even after you, you're getting through this, you actually have to use atherectomy just to get a, a reasonable result. So it's quite complex disease. Also, we have eccentric calcified lesions in high risk areas. So maybe atherectomy is a useful thing here because we, we don't really want to put a stent in this region. And in this case, it works. However, they forget to tell you when you should be using a therectomy that with a therectomy comes the whole baggage. I think if you're using a therectomy, you really have to be using protection devices. So if you're doing it in the private sector, that's going to be much more, much more expensive. If, if you're doing it somewhere else, it's just going to be more hassle, longer procedure, and I personally cause some damage with a protection device. And, I'm, and those are one of the best protection devices. So, uh, it, it makes things more complicated, but if you're going to go down the route of advanced procedures, you really have to use that. Access anti-grade ultrasound guided if you can. Sometimes you can't, well you could work with what you can. This SFA was proximally occluded, so you had, we had to sort of cross over, despite a very tortuous iliac, and you just have to open it. It's just, these patients are quite desperate, so you're going to have to do whatever you can to get in-line flow. In-line flow is really important, as Dr. Mamoun said. If you can't get in-line flow, that ulcer is not going to heal, and your procedure is just, it's just a waste of time. So just a, just a comment, I think you can do a crossover procedure for proximal tibial lesions. If you're doing distal tibial lesions and pedals, I mean, I find it very difficult. So that's why I'd rather go with anti-grade if possible. Other alternative access is pedal. It's the access of last resort. It's good, but uh, you know, the micropuncture devices that we have in Jordan are very good. However, you have to be careful that you know, if handled incorrectly, you can get a fantastic recanalization but a dead foot. And crossing, uh, I mean, just, I personally would not use anything apart from a 14 in the tibial, in the popliteal, maybe a 35. And then in Jordan we've got very good devices, we've got a lot of options in terms of crossing. 14 and 14 associated catheters. Don't sort of, I hate using a 35 based catheter or a 14 device because that's where you're going to cause damage. Um, they have to be angulated and hydrophilic. And you'll be, you'll be surprised how much uh, front forward pressure you can get. The devices on the right hand side, I'm sure a lot of you will know about them, but they're re-entry devices, atherectomy devices. I personally try not to use them as much as possible, and you'd be surprised um, how infrequently you need to use them. Uh, you know, money is an issue, of course. Flexible devices, I mean, you know, it'd be hypocritical of me to talk to cardiologists about flexible devices and fine devices, because you guys are much more familiar with working with it. But for us, vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists, I think we were only sort of relatively recent introduction to microcatheters and, and flexible catheters and flexible balloons. 
these were not the usual. I mean, we have long balloons that are quite flexible that can do this. And actually, these made the difference as opposed to putting a drug on the balloon, having dedicated below, below the knee uh, uh, balloons. Uh, and and, it, and some procedure, I mean, these, these balloons have to be quite tough. So you can't use a coronary balloon for these kinds of lesions because they're just going to burst. Uh, and also, I don't think cardiologists sort of, in coronary interventions, you've got very long balloons. Uh, and, and I would personally uh, use for long lesions, long balloons. Um, that makes the procedure last a little bit longer, you've got less dissection and less trauma. Um, the final sort of comments about practicality is that in this case I tried a new balloon, I didn't know why I tried it, but it wasn't working. And the reason is it wasn't a rapid exchange balloon. For me, rapid exchange is very far away from if you're working at the ankle. All I had to do is go back to one of my familiar balloons and I got through that without any problem. Also, imaging. Do not, I, I personally can't make a decision on this image. You have to really do a selective below knee angiogram. Because this patient, for example, was, was said that there's no options for her based on this angio. But actually, that led to her sort of having delayed treatment and had advancing gangrene. So you debride first, you find a vessel, you open the arch. If you've got, got a penal arch that's open, it, you know that it's going to heal. And you know, a few months down the line, this patient has got an intact foot. It's not pretty, but it's functional. And also, this patient had heart failure and renal failure and wouldn't really have survived any major amputation. So last few slides, just to talk about the reality. So this is the reality, and this is sort of 2018 data, okay? Um, not much has changed. Most patients will be dead. The point to say, we have to really try and revascularize by any mean, because if you look at the numbers that below, the median survival for anyone having an amputation, irrespective of their presentation, is 15 months, okay? So that's really quite bad. Um, whatever you do though, most 30% of your patients will either be dead or without a limb. So it doesn't matter how patients present, yes. If you present with an ulcer, you're one and a half times more likely to die. If you present with gangrene, you're two to three times more likely to die. Chronic kidney disease is up there with gangrene as well. According to treatment modality, you're much more likely to die of any cause if you have an amputation. And also, irrespective of um, presentation, if you have an amputation, you're really not gonna survive much. So, um, you can end up with amputation five to six times more commonly if you present with gangrene. And the older patients, it's a common point because this is actually, a lot of our patients are quite old. Three times more likely to end up with a, with a, with a, with a major amputation. And five times if you're over 90. So if we think of doing an 80 year old, you've got to really think, are we doing the right thing? So this is just provisional data from Jordan. I want, you know, it's not completely ready, but I thought it's the right sort of forum to share with what we're doing. This is predominantly data from where I work at Jordan University Hospital, and it's not clean data yet, so you have to sort of just bear with me. It's the last couple of slides. In uh, the last year, we've just included patients who've managed to complete 12 months of follow-up. Unfortunately, and this is new to me because I'm new to Jordan, not many patients want to be followed up in Jordan. If they're doing well, you don't see them. If not doing well, you don't see them as well, or you may see their relatives. So that we had, I think, about 40% of dropout of patients for, for a variety of reasons. So a total of patients was 86 patients. Median age is 60. This is very low. I mean, 60-year-olds having CLI. That's, that's quite bad. I mean, we have as young as, as 36. Clearly smoking and smoking and shisha are, are, are a bad combination. And most of them are current smokers, as we've said. Most do come with ulcers, and they're quite bad ulcers, but um, you know, a good sort of 25% of them will have uh, gangrene as well. And a smaller percentage, about 20%, had rest pain and true rest pain. So effectively, BTK disease alone was a minority. A lot of these patients have above knee and below knee. Obviously, I haven't really looked into the data to see what that means, but it just means that we have femoral popliteal or aorta iliac disease as well. And this makes the procedure longer, you have to stage your procedure, and it, you, know, you may miss the boat. The in-hospital mortality was very low, I think we've probably missed a couple, but it is what it is, and it's, uh, as you'd expect, it's probably predominantly cardiovascular. The lower extremity amputation is uh, about 13% at 12 months. I think this is probably low as well, but uh, this is our reality, and I thought it might be interesting to show that with you. And again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk.